And I'm very pleased to be joined right now from my dear friend from the great state of New York, Anthony Weiner. Anthony, how are you doing today? Well, I, I thank you very much. And, you know, I am maybe an honorary member of the Progressive Caucus. I'm not a member of the caucus, but I'm very interested in the work that you've done on this issue. And I just want to pick up on a point that you just made. You know, part of the reason why doctors understand the need for the public option is they every day deal with insurance companies. You know, you and I, when we get sick, and God willing, that's not often, our constituents, when they get sick, they have to deal with their insurance companies. They deal with them every day. They've got six or seven different inboxes on their desk. They've got about 20% of their overhead is dealing with insurance companies. And I don't mean dealing with them, hey, how you doing? Let's have a donut and a coffee together, sitting on hold getting approval, trying to find out when they're going to get reimbursed, months and months and months waiting for insurance companies to give them money for services they've already provided. So when doctors look at this debate, they say, you know what, having some level of competition is helpful to them as well. And just so we understand the context of this, you know, we swing wildly between people who say the public option and this health care debate is going to transform the world and people who say it's not going to really do anything. Somewhere in between is probably right. When this health care plan goes into effect under the present proposal we have here in the House, for most Americans, they're not even going to have the ability to go sign up for the public option because they get health insurance at their work. If they decide to leave their employer, they're going to leave whatever the employer is putting into the kitty. So they're probably not going to do that. They effectively are not going to go into the public option. If you're on Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, Department of Defense, you're not going to be even eligible to go into the public option. So the people who are going to benefit are a small group of people, an important group of people who are underinsured, meaning their, their employer doesn't provide even the, the, the basic health insurance that we believe they should, or they have no coverage at all. They're going to be able to go shop, and even of those people, it's going to take a while for this public option to get up and running. But the reason it's so important, and you've made this point continually during this debate, is we should have at least some experiment with how it might work. So that, and it's someone that, through which we can look at the lens and say, you know what, here's a private insurance company paying for advertisements, paying bonuses, probably the public option, the CEO of the public option will probably make, you know, I don't know, $190,000 a year, or whatever it is. Someone who's going to be going out there and versus an institution, a public option, which might say, you know what, maybe we can do it for less because we don't have to look out for shareholders. And that sliver of competition has the insurance companies mortified. And the question is why? Why are they so afraid? Because at the end of the day, I say to my colleague from Minnesota, at the end of the day, it could just be that these insurance companies say, you know what, if I'm going to compete maybe I have to turn a little bit less over to profits, a little bit less to advertising and to bonuses. Now, for them, that might not be so good, but for the rest of us and for the country as a whole, that is actually probably a pretty good thing. But if, if the gentleman would yield certainly, briefly, I'll hand it right back to Jim from New York, but I just want to throw this out there. I, I, I propose this, that the people who support the public option and the people who oppose the public option do so for the same reason. One is that the public option will be competitive, and because they don't have to funnel monies into these things that don't really go to care, we'll be able to provide a cost-competitive uh, product for people to be able to purchase. Well, let me, let me make one other point. First, it's funny. I read the, You made that observation, great minds think alike or average minds think alike. <laughs> I had written an op-ed a month ago, made the same exact point that actually the two sides agree on this. But what's interesting about some of my Republican friends who have fought so vehemently against this is at the end of the day, we're introducing another market player, okay? That is, you always want more market players because that's where competition comes from. We're introducing another one. Now, we tied its hands behind its back a bit more than I would have liked, but we're introducing another market player. And it's fascinating because the argument seems to be, wait a minute, if you give my constituents choice, they might take it. Now, it's fine that we... You know, we apparently believe that our colleagues are smart enough, our, our constituents are smart enough to choose us to be their representatives. But, oh, no, we can't trust them to be smart enough to choose the health insurance plan. That's their work. And, by the way, I already see the TV commercials. Don't go with them. You don't want government-funded health care. Yeah, the, the private insurance companies are going to try to do everything possible to compete with, with, in that way. But 
at the end of the day, we're trying to introduce market forces where they don't exist today. And let me just, I'm taking too much of your time, but let me just make this one final point. We hear all the time from the other side, let the marketplace work. There is no marketplace for health care as a commodity the way we know it. Keep talking. If I have an appendix burst right now standing here, I'm not going to say, you know what, I'm not going to get an appendix, I'm going to shop for a liver instead. Or I'm not going to say, you know, I'm going to wait, I understand, the appendix go on sale in December, I'm going to wait. Or I'm not going to, I don't have the ability to say, I'm going to go buy some books and learn how to sew up my own appendix. That doesn't happen. And if I am like 80% of all people that get their insurance from, a, from an employer, I have one option. My employer walks in and says, congratulations, everyone here at the supermarket. We have Blue Cross, and we have Oxford, and here's the coverage. I don't get to say, hey, boss, uh-uh, I'm going to go take, give, give me my money, I'm going to go shop around a little bit more. That doesn't happen. So the idea that we have some kind of a free market, guaranteed choice, doesn't exist. Now, we're introducing a little bit here, but at the end of the day, this is not a commodity like a suit of clothes that you can say, I'm going to buy or I'm going to not. And it's also true when people say, why should I have to get insurance? I'm not sick. Well, you might not be sick today. God forbid someone, you get hit by a car and you have $170,000 worth of insurance, of, of health care costs, and $100 in your pocket. You know who's paying, Mr. Ellison? You and I are. So the idea that we have, well, what happened to the idea of letting us all make free choices? The right of, uh, you know, of, of your choice stops where it starts impacting me. As, as, as my father would frequently say to me when he was explaining to me the law, the right of my fist stops at your nose. And you can't have this kind of conversation that we, that we had. But to, if you really believe in the marketplace, introduce more players. And that's what... Mr. Ellison has talked about, and that's what the Progressive Caucus talked about, and that's what, frankly, overwhelming numbers of Americans and overwhelming numbers of doctors are talking about. If you're interested in making sure that, that we have a marketplace that is not just dominated by the idea if you can afford to pay, you do. And let me make this final, I know I keep saying final point. There's one other thing. You know, I have made the point that insurance companies at the end of the day for health care are not like insurance companies in any other walk of life. Your car insurance company, since we all have automobile insurance coverage, they're apportioning risk. They're trying to figure out how you spread risk around the whole. Health insurance companies don't do that. They're not covering anyone over 65. They're not covering anyone who has a pre-existing condition. Effectively, people like my father who tried to get health insurance before he was 65 were charged so much he effectively couldn't get it. So they're not really doing that either. So then the question becomes, what are the insurance companies doing? They're taking our money and giving it to doctors, giving it to hospitals, giving it to clinics. But they're putting 20% in their pocket. So why don't we, if we're trying to figure out savings, not that I have anything, I mean, insurance companies aren't venal people. They're doing what we, frankly, have allowed them to, to do, and they've risen up for natural reasons. Let's start with that 20%. Let's start with that 350 or so billion dollars out of a $2.5 trillion pot, and let's, you know what? Let's put that back into health care. Let's put that back into tax cuts. Let's put that back into other services. Frankly, that's the argument behind the public option, and it's 4% overhead compared to the health insurance plan that I have, which has about a 25% overhead. And I thank the gentleman so much for yielding.